When I think of timeless games that give me the same feeling as when I originally played them, the first one that comes to mind is Halo Combat Evolved. I still find myself periodically deciding to play through the campaign on Legendary again. Not for achievements, not for YouTube, not to become an amazing speedrunner, but because playing through the game, even though it's been out over 21 years and I played it since I was a kid, is still fun. When it was announced that Halo 4 was in production, I was super hyped to see the continuation of Master Chief's story and see what a new studio created specifically to make Halo games could do with the franchise. Once Halo 4 finally came out, I played it with my friends and we had fun with it. But something just felt off. And after a couple months, we went back to Reach, and I haven't touched my copy of Halo 4 since. But why? Halo 4 has better graphics, it has more game modes, Spartan Ops adds so much more content to the game, it has more customization, it has a multiplayer progression system, so why did I stop playing it when I still play Halo 1, which is over a decade older? I think it can be summarized with this phrase, 30 seconds of fun. In Halo 1, there was maybe 30 seconds of fun that happened over and over and over and over again. So if you can get 30 seconds of fun, you can pretty much stretch that out to be an entire game. Encountering a bunch of guys, melee attacking one of them before they were aware, throwing a grenade into a group of other guys, and then cleaning up the stragglers before they could surround you. And so you can have all the great graphics and all the different characters and lots of different weapons with amazing effects, but if you don't nail that 30 seconds, you're not gonna have a great game. 30 Seconds of Fun is a quote from Jamie Griezmer in 2003 that every die-hard Halo fan is familiar with. But out of everything in the nearly hour-long Halo 2 behind-the-scenes documentary, why is that short clip what stands out to most fans? Simply put, it's brilliant, and it represents everything that Old School Bungie was about. Bungie was founded in 1991 by two University of Chicago students, Alex Seropian and Jason Jones. Well, technically Alex founded the company and Jason joined shortly thereafter, but you can think of them as co-founders. Of the two, Alex was more business-oriented, while Jason was more creative. In the words of Jason Jones, I was working on a game, and Alex was trying to start a company. While Bungie now is known for Halo and Destiny, in the 90s they were one of the most respected game developers for the Mac, releasing a string of critical and commercially successful games. In 1993, Bungie released Pathways into Darkness. Pathways sold over 20,000 copies, making it Bungie's first commercially successful game as it was their first to turn a profit. Building on the success of Pathways into Darkness, Bungie moved into their first office and released Marathon in 1994. Marathon was an even bigger success than Pathways, selling over 100,000 copies in its first year. This spawned two sequels, which were also critically and commercially successful, and in just a few years, Bungie had established itself as a legitimate studio capable of creating quality games. They followed the Marathon trilogy by shifting to a completely new genre, real-time strategy. They released two more successful games, Myth and Myth 2, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Myth 2 was not profitable for Bungie. Right after Bungie began shipping the game to retailers, a bug was discovered where if you uninstalled Myth 2, there was a chance that your entire hard drive could be erased. So, after they discovered this, Bungie decided to recall every single copy of Myth 2, which ended up costing them about a million dollars. When asked about the recall, Jason Jones said, The thing that made the decision easy was that if we were to ship the game anyway and try to fix the problem later, some people were gonna get screwed. And that was wrong. It might not have been very many people, maybe one or two, but it would have bothered us the rest of our lives. This decision did end up leaving Bungie in a financial hole, but it also strengthened their reputation. So when Bungie started looking for buyers, Microsoft jumped at the opportunity, and in 2000, Bungie was acquired by Microsoft. This deal meant that their newest project, Halo Combat Evolved, which began production in 1999, would be an exclusive launch title for the original Xbox, a new console from a company that had never made a console before in a market dominated by Sony and Nintendo. The Dreamcast also existed, but we don't really talk about that one. Developing a launch title, Bungie knew that they had a chance to be THE game on a brand new system, and they worked to make that a reality. So many elements and people came together to make Halo Combat Evolved what it was, and I want to recognize a few. First and foremost, Microsoft itself deserves credit. Bungie had had a rebellious persona, and with the acquisition from Microsoft, many of their fans thought that they were selling out. But although Bungie was now part of Microsoft, they fought to keep their own independence and ways of doing things. Microsoft, seeing the bigger picture, allowed Bungie to basically run themselves. Marty O'Donnell had worked on scores for Bungie games in the past, but in 1999, he was hired as an official Bungie employee. Marty was the audio lead composer and one of two credited sound designers for the first Halo game. Marty is is, hands down, the best video game composer of all time. Every single track on the original Halo soundtrack 
is memorable and great. My personal favorite is Undercover of Night. As a small team, Bungie employees would cross over into areas other than their own and they had a culture of pushback, giving input, self-critique, and this means that even someone like Marty, who wrote music, recorded dialogue, etc., had other influence in seemingly random aspects of Halo, like the first Flood encounter. Now, this is where it's all right here. What Jamie wanted to do here is immediately have, boom, the Flood attack. And I said, please, just give me a little time Mm -hmm. to say, all right, you this saved, is a creepy place. You saved Halo 1. I did. <laughs> right here. So when I say that Halo 1's story should be credited to Jason Jones and Joe Staten, I'm sure that they weren't the only ones to come up with plot points or ideas. As project lead, Jason helped plan out the higher level story of Combat Evolved while Joe Staten, as director of cinematics and writer of mission scripts, executed the story. When you watch a Halo 1 cinematic, the cinematography, dialogue, everything was Joe. In the script of each mission, for example, in the silent cartographer, you're looking for the map to control room and Cortana says this and Captain Key says that, that's Joe Staten. To give a picture of how beloved Joe is, when he was hired by 343 Industries in 2020 to work on Halo Infinite, the Halo community was ecstatic. And just a few days ago when Joe left 343, the community now is heartbroken and saying that Halo is dead. But back to the good times, Jason Jones, Joe Staten, and everyone else at Bungie helped create, from a story perspective, a perfect first act. It's similar to the original Star Wars in that, in both cases, they didn't know that there would be a sequel, and so they both tell standalone, complete stories while also building a world and foundation that could later be built on, through primary story entries and expanded lore through other forms of media. Halo helps set many new standards in gaming, but there's one specific aspect where Halo's legacy still shines. Controls. Halo wasn't the first console first-person shooter, but prior to Halo, consensus was that FPS games were meant for computers. It makes sense, it's intuitive. How do you aim and shoot? You move your mouse and click. While yeah, console shooters like GoldenEye exist and were beloved, playing a shooter on this was weird compared to a keyboard and mouse. The Xbox's Duke controller was a great controller for the time and the problems that did exist with it were pretty much entirely solved by the S-Type later on and for what Bungie had to work with, they mapped the buttons perfectly. Things we take for granted now, walking with the left stick and aiming with the right stick feels great. I don't think it was the best Halo control scheme, I think the Xbox 360 adding bumpers was a great change and I prefer Halo Reach's controls, but for the time, perfect. In whatever doubts someone may have had about a console first person shooter just working, I think we're destroyed. Although there are obviously still people who prefer mouse and keyboard, the fact that it's even debatable is a testament to Bungie. There are so many things that made the original Halo great. Besides what I've already mentioned, there's the flood twist where the game just completely tonally shifts from epic sci-fi space opera to horror. The multiplayer and LAN parties, the perfectly balanced difficulties where as a five-year-old I could beat the game on easy and as a grown-up, legendary feels challenging but not unfair like some other entries in the franchise. I can sit here and analyze this game or whatever, but there's just the fact that killing grunts with the assault rifle is fun. Headshotting in a with the Magnum or the sniper rifle is fun. When Jamie Griezmer is saying that Halo 1 was 30 seconds of fun stretched out to be an entire game, he didn't mean that literally, that it was the exact same encounters presented the exact same way over and over again. He was describing Halo's core gameplay loop. He's saying that the foundation that Halo was built on before anything else was fun. Once you have a fun core gameplay loop, you can build on that by introducing new enemies and vehicles and environments and weapons and so on. But if your core gameplay is not fun, you can add whatever it is you want. You can have the greatest graphics or the best animations or whatever, but if your foundation is not fun, your game won't be great. That's what Old School Bungie represented. They were, at their core, gamers who wanted to make the most fun games they could. We are the most cynical people, like we are the jaded crowd who, if a game doesn't entertain us in five minutes, we stop playing it. That's the mindset that allowed Bungie to create one of the greatest games ever. But right from the start, the design of the groups was not consistent about reinforcing that they are meant to be worthy adversaries for the player. When I was a kid who couldn't wait for the release of Halo 3, I would wake up every morning and watch the Halo 3 VDoc Et 2 Brute, where they describe their changes to the Brutes in Halo 3. Bungie did several of these for Halo 3, Halo 3 ODST, and Halo Reach. As well, the limited editions of Halo 2 and 3 contain DVDs with various extras, including behind-the-scenes documentaries for each game. If I had to summarize the VDocs, behind-the- scenes documentaries and developer commentaries in one word, that word would be refreshing. 
When you watch behind the scenes content and employee interviews from companies like Disney or 343 Industries, it feels fake. The whole thing just feels like marketing. Which, don't get me wrong, obviously a Bungie Halo documentary is also just marketing, but it feels real. To watch Bungie go from super excited about Halo 2 to depressed and miserable after realizing how much content they have to cut, and talking about how much it sucks and how they're working 80 hour weeks, and when you listen to those Bungie employees now, they say, yeah, making Halo 2 sucked. It's so funny, like, the Halo 1 crunch was, you know, it was intense, but I don't have any negative memories of it at all. No, Halo I 2, I have so many, and Halo 3, I even I have some, but... It's an accurate telling of what happened. When you listen to the developer commentaries with Jason Jones, Joe Staten, and Marty O'Donnell, they talk about developing each game and you learn a lot about it, but it isn't just them talking about how awesome their games are. They're joking with each other, they're pointing out errors and mistakes, talking about what was cut, and just roasting their own game. I and I love the cheese yeah. animation there. And he like starts running away before he even knows what he's doing. <laughs> I'm going, I'm doing it. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going. <laughs> it's this that makes a quote like 30 seconds of fun impactful. You know that it's not just marketing BS. When Jamie Griezmer says that, you know he means it. When Adrian Perez talks about the difference between good enough and awesome and how good enough sucks, you know that he means it. I don't want to turn this into a 343 bash fest, but when thinking about why Halo 4 just didn't work for me when I loved all the games prior, including Reach, I think it's simply that 343 did not understand what made Bungie's Halo games great, and they didn't have the same passion for making great games. A 343 developer will talk about how great the Promethean effects are, that enemies dissolve when you kill them with a Promethean weapon. Okay, great, but for the most part, all of these Promethean weapons with cool effects are functionally just clones of other weapons. And cool, I killed a knight with a Promethean weapon and he dissolved, but that doesn't change the fact that knights are not fun to fight. I can still play the original Halo, and although aged, I think it still looks great. Halo 4 makes my eyes bleed. And to give credit to 343, even though it's entirely different people now than then, I think Infinite looks awesome. I mentioned this already, but Joe Staten decided to leave 343 Industries a few days ago. Along with this, 343 laid off about 10,000 employees. For me, Infinite did remind me of the original Halo games, and I think it was a big improvement over 4 and 5, and although I still prefer the original games and I think Infinite just did not have enough content, the hiring of original Bungie staff like Staten, like Paul Bertone, made me think that Infinite would eventually become something great, and at the very least it was in good hands. Now that's obviously not the case. But I can sit here and be a pessimist and mourn the Halo franchise and talk about how horrible everything is, but I'm not really interested in that. What I do know is that old school Bungie was lightning in a bottle, and although we'll never see something like them again, during that time they created some of my favorite games ever. So regardless of what happens with future Halo titles or whatever Bungie now does with Destiny, even if they release the most god-awful things I've ever played, none of that will take away from Bungie's early greatness, and I'll still be playing their Halo games.